Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's BioForum presentation entitled Relationship Between Honeybee Health and Pollination in Agroecosystems. Our BioForum webinar is scheduled to run from 1.30 p.m. until approximately 2.30 Eastern Time. My name is Dan McClellan, and I'm the e-learning coordinator for the BioNetwork BioEd Center located at Gaston College in Dallas, North Carolina. Our panelist today is Dr. Juliana Rangel of NC State University, and in just a moment, I'll turn it over to Dr. Rangel for today's presentation. If at any time during today's presentation you have a question, please feel free to type it in the chat box located on the right side of the screen. I'll be keeping a record of each question that is submitted, and we'll have a time at the end of the presentation to address all of your questions. And be sure to send your chats to all participants. Before we get started, we'd like to know who we have in our audience today. Now, I've loaded a poll, and you should see it on the right side of your screen. So please go ahead and select the option that best describes you. Also, we want to have an accurate record of your participation in today's BioForum, so please let us know if you are sharing a screen by typing the total number of participants at your location in for question two. Now, if you're the only person viewing at your screen, then just type in number one. Now, while you're doing that, I encourage you to mark your calendars for our March Bioform entitled Carteret Community College's Aquaculture Program, Applying Marine Sciences on the North Carolina Coast. More information and registration is available online at ncbionetwork.org. Thank you very much. We're excited to have all of you meeting with us. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Rangel. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, can you hear me fine, Dan? I have you coming through loud and clear. Great. Okay. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity today. I'm really happy to be um, talking to you about the importance of honeybee health on pollination services in agroecosystems. This um, topic will be full of information and I tend to speak fast, so I will try to keep an eye on the um, um, the area of the screen where you can write questions. If you couldn't hear me well, um, I also have a little bit of an accent, so if you can't hear me fine or if you didn't understand something I said, uh, please let me know and I'll try to uh, repeat it. But as I said earlier, we're going to talk, uh, we're going to go over a lot of information and the intent of this uh, webinar is not really to um, give you a lot of details and you don't have to worry about numbers and a lot of these um, numbers that you'll see but it's um, a way for you to see or kind of get your feet wet in all of this vast pool of information there is out there about uh, honeybee health and how it relates to a lot of different factors. And so um, I encourage you to, if you have time, um, look at these yellow uh, references that I will be having next to a lot of the um, key uh, points that I'm going to point out in the bullet in bullets. And uh, you can uh, later either email me or look these references up on the web and then you'll learn a lot more information uh, than I will be providing today. But in any case, here is the outline for today. Let's see. Okay. So first I'm going to give you a brief introduction about what I mean by uh, pollination services and agroecosystems. And so I'm just going to make a few definitions so that uh, we are all up to speed. Then I'm going to give you a brief um, pollination biology a crash course uh, talking about the biology of both the pollinator, that is the honeybee, and also about the flower and how uh, pollination occurs out in nature. Then I will brief, uh, jump right into the economic impact of honeybee pollination, uh, not only uh, nationwide, but also globally, and even uh, you will see a lot of interesting data on pollination services done by honeybees on a lot of the crops that we produce here in North Carolina. 
Then I will, this will probably take most of the lecture, um, and it has to do with the factors that influence honeybee health. And so here's where we're going to see a lot of different scientific studies that have been done on the topic. And um, so we'll probably uh, spend a, a, a lot of time here. And then hopefully by the toward the end of the lecture, I hope uh, that we will all come to the agreement, although I think we probably all uh, feel already this way, that having healthy honeybees will or does equate to having healthy ecosystems and vice versa. Having healthy ecosystems will lead to a healthier honeybee um, community and thus um, uh, in turn the health of our ecosystems and the food that we consume. And I will leave you with some conclusions and uh, some take home messages. So to begin with, we need to start off with some uh, definitions of what um, what I mean by the relationship between honeybee health and pollination services and ecosystems. So I don't know if you see the um, the cartoon on the uh, screen, but here we have a honeybee that brings flowers to another honeybee, and you see, well, great, you brought me work. And that's true because honeybees are always at work in flowers uh, collecting nectar and pollen. And so they're because they're doing this to uh, keep their colonies growing, they're inadvertently providing a service that is pollinating or cross-pollinating a lot of different flowers and different crops. So that's the uh, that's the question that we want to answer is what's that relationship between honeybee health and pollination services? So let's first define a few um, terminology. An ecosystem is a community of organisms that interacts with their physical environment. So for example, in this picture, you see, um, you don't see a lot of animals, but you're here, you're seeing all of these plant uh, communities interacting with each other and with the different animals and other organisms in their environment, and they're also interacting with um, the uh, physical resources like water and uh, air and, and different um, gases and, and molecules and whatnot. Then more specifically, an agroecosystem is a type of ecosystem, and it's a spatial and functional unit of agricultural activity that is formed it's a result of the interactions between organisms and their physical environment, but in this case, these, as this picture shows, this is a pumpkin um, farm. It is um, this kind of interaction um, humans are taking advantage, of, uh, taking advantage of because at the end of these uh, interactions between the plants and their environment, we uh, obtain the pumpkins for our consumption. And then within those agroecosystems, we have what are known as ecosystem services. Those are the benefits to human welfare that are provided by the organisms that are in those ecosystems and are interacting um, within those ecosystems. So think about it right now. I mean, we don't have a very interactive classroom, so I don't think we can really, uh, I can ask you for your opinions. But think briefly, given this definition, what would be an example of an ecosystem service, being that those are the benefits to us that are provided by the organisms interacting in the environment? Experts currently recognize four different categories of ecosystem services, and here they are. We have provisioning services. Those are um, services such as food, including seafood and game. We have crops, wild food, spices, water, all the pharmaceuticals, biochemicals, um, energy, and actually pollination. So provisioning services like you see here, it's all the kind of food that we are being um, we're receiving from the interactions of, of the organisms in their physical environment. We also have regulating services. Those are services such as carbon sequestration, climate regulation, um, waste decomposition, and detoxification. So here, for example, we have carbon sequestration in this picture of um, biochar. Then we have supporting services, uh, for example, nutrient dispersal and cycling or seed dispersal and primary production. So we have a lot of different kinds of um, 
webs and cycles going on, like here in this picture we have the water cycle. Finally, we have the cultural services. Those are some, the, this is the more surprising kind of service, uh, but these are um, cultural and intellectual and even spiritual services where we get um, sometimes uh, spiritual inspiration or we are provided with the ability to have some recreational experiences that include uh, ecotourism or even scientific discovery. Okay, so those are the kinds of ecosystem services. More uh, specifically, we have pollination by wild animals as being a key ecosystem service. So here we have bats that are uh, pollinating different kinds of flowers and the same for hummingbirds. And it's been shown over and over, um, over the last uh, couple of decades, that crop pollination is an example of a threatened and sometimes even endangered ecosystem service. And, and you can imagine why, because um, we are being faced with the decline of a lot of these animal species that are key pollinators of a lot of different crops. So. Um, there's a lot of examples of endangered or threatened ecosystem services out in nature. So about 75% or more of all flowering plants rely on animal pollination. So that's a big chunk. Uh, three quarters of all the flowering plants rely on animal pollination. And uh, there's a, over 200,000 species of animals that act as wild pollinators, so that's a, also a large number. But even more interestingly is that only a thousand of these are either hummingbirds, bats, and or small mammals, leaving the rest of the pollination needs to be performed by insects such as beetles, bees, ants wasps, butterflies, and moths. So imagine that there's almost more than 200,000 species of insects that are providing all of these pollination services to us. The honeybee, which is the focus of today's talk, is one of the most important um, pollinating um, in the, uh, species that we get a lot of services from. Honeybees provide us with a lot of uh, different products from the hive and thus services. We are all used to and enjoy the benefits of consuming honey. But bees also produce uh, wax and wax products, and we create a lot of different products from the wax that uh, bees produce inside the hive. And also even uh, propolis, which is a special resin that bees produce to seal cracks inside the hive that have some antimicrobial properties, is used in um, a lot of pharmaceutical uh, endeavors uh, to increase um, our health in many ways. So these are the three um, so three of the top four uh, services that we're getting from pollinate, uh, from uh, honeybees. But um, as we know and we suspect, uh, the most important service, uh, ecosystem service that honeybees are providing is pollination. As you see here in this picture, we have a person that is um, monitoring hives in a huge uh, crop orchard that is in bloom. So the honeybee is the most important and economically value pollinator of crop monocultures worldwide. And yields of, of some fruit, seed, and nut crops uh, drop by over 90% without honeybee pollination. And so I, I'll go into this uh, in more detail right here. So uh, this graph has a lot of information, but I'll walk you through it. We have on our first y-axis, we have all the different um, crops, um, main crops that are um, vary in the level of need for pollination from insects and especially honeybees. Here we have in the at the bottom of the um, x-axis we have the percentage of each crop that is pollinated by each pollinator type going from zero to a hundred percent. In the blue we have the percentage of that crop that is pollinated by honeybees and then in orange the percentage of that crop that's pollinated by other insects and in gray, we have the percentage of that crop that is pollinated by other individuals, including mammals, birds, and then um, other uh, physical aspects like wind and water. 
And on the secondary y-axis here, we have the crop value in billions of dollars for in 2006 for each one of those crops. So first, looking at that secondary y-axis with the value of um, each crop annually, you can see that there is a lot of money at stake in the production of these crops nationwide yearly, um, some having a higher impact or at least economic impact than others. Um, so we'll go over that uh, briefly later, um, and it's uh, especially when it pertains to pollination of these um, or the value of these crops in North Carolina. But I want to point out that some, uh, although some um, crops like soybeans only require maybe less than 10% of honeybee pollination, others like those that you see inside this red box, like almonds, depend 100% on honeybee pollination. So without honeybees, we would not be able to consume um, almonds. And apples, even though um, we don't require, they don't require pollination for production of fruit. They require 90% pollination by honeybees and 100% insect pollination to produce no, new varieties of apples. And the same um, is the case for the cultivated kind uh, of blueberries that we consume. So there is a definite need um, in some of these crops that is almost 100% um, uh, need of, of honeybee pollination. Here in the next graph, we have the economic impact of honeybee pollination in the United States. On the x-axis, we have the year. So these are records that have gone um, from 1945. On the y-axis, we have the total number of millions of managed colonies of honeybees. This is not including feral population. This is just the, mil the number of colonies that have been um, uh, recorded as existing in the United States um, over the last uh, 60 years or more. So as you can see, in 1945, the recorded number of managed colonies was about 5.5 million. And these numbers have decreased um, dramatically over time, steadily over time, uh, such that by now in 2010, the latest record is um, on, that we have about 2.3 million colonies of honeybees, managed colonies of honeybees. So this number compared to that, that we, the number we had over 60 years ago has um, basically cut in, be cutting um, half. And if anyone is wondering, this uh, sharp drop here has to do with the advent of the parasitic mite Varroa destructor that, as the, its name indicates, kind of pretty much destroyed um, not only the feral population of honeybees, but also um, the number of uh, managed colonies. So there's been a, a rapid decrease in the number of existing colonies. And as I said earlier, 90% or more of the population of feral colonies has also disappeared. Now, on this other y-axis, we have crop production in um, million pounds. And as you can see, over time, we have seen, conversely, an increase in the production of certain crops, for instance, those that require honeybee pollination for their production. So apples have uh, more than doubled its production over the last 50 years. And very interestingly, um, almonds have skyrocketed in production, uh, having less than a billion pounds produced in 1960 to now almost having um, two billion pounds produced uh, in 2010 with the expected number of, uh, of billions of pounds uh, that are going to be produced in the next five years or so, um, uh, expecting to surpass the number of um, colonies available for the pollination of these crops. So there is an, incre an ever-increasing uh, production of these um, uh, that require 100% uh, honeybee pollination, and conversely, we are actually dropping our um, number of managed colonies over time. So that's uh, that's actually that's kind of quite worrying, and that's why we're trying to work hard on on trying to increase that population of managed colonies. 
So um, that's a brief introduction, and I will talk about those factors, uh, the economic impact of honeybees on honeybee pollination later uh, in, in further detail. But first, I want to um, kind of go over uh, honeybee pollination biology, how it works um, on both the plant and, plants and, and the, um, the insect uh, end. A honeybee's body is very well adapted for pollination. And as you will see, pollination is not something that honeybees do um, um, knowingly. Um, in fact, it's kind of like um, a trick that um, flowers are produ providing these uh, food rewards, um, like ne in the form of nectar and pollen, and in return, the bee is providing that pollination service, cross pollination. And so, because there is has been a coevolution of the morphology of both the plant and its pollinator, the bee's body is very well adapted for uh, pollination. They have plumos or, hair, or uh, feathery hairs uh, that are very good for pollen trapping, as that uh, blown up picture shows right there. They have compound eyes that have color vision um, that uh, expands down to the UV spectrum. So they actually see color in a different way that we do. They have a proboscis for imbibing nectar. The proboscis, proboscis is the, the mouth parts, and so they're really good at imbibing nectar from flower uh, sources. And they have a corbicula, or a pollen basket, located in their hind legs that allows them to store pollen balls that they uh, collect at the flowers and then they bring back to the hive. As I was saying about color vision and how bees see different than we do, this is um, the spectrum of visible light. Uh, here's the spectrum that we see uh, as humans. So we see anywhere from uh, purple all the way to the red, uh, from four, about 400 to 700 nanometers. But bees actually see differently than we do. They have vision that expands below our range of vision, and it goes down to the ultraviolet um, spectrum of light. Um, segment of, of uh, visible light, something that we cannot see here. But they are, um, they're kind of, their spectrum of visible light is shifted to the left because they're actually unable to read, uh, to see um, colors in the red uh, spectrum. So they they see very differently than we do. And for that reason, um, if flowers have co-evolved um, these different visual stimuli or, or uh, guides so that they guide the bees to uh, locating them more easily. On a curious note, uh, here we have a picture of a hummingbird feeder. And uh, people who like to attract hummingbirds to their gardens, um, they get unwanted visitors, uh, namely honeybees and, and, and other um, insects. And so here you have these honeybees are visiting this hummingbird feeder. And uh, and so a way for you to get rid of your bee problem, uh, a suggestion is that um, these the bees are seeing this yellow flower. So they're getting attracted. They're getting a visual cue. And then, of course, because they're getting a food reward, they're going back and, and, co and recruiting other workers to come and, and, and feed here. But a way for you to easily try to get rid of this problem would be to replace this flower with a red flower, red petals, because the bees can't see them. So they wouldn't kind of stand out um, to them, uh, and they wouldn't quite necessarily go and visit that resource because they don't see the difference between this background and the red petals. So that's kind of curious. It's just, it shows how see the bees see differently, and we can use that knowledge to our advantage. And bee and flowers also use this to their advantage. They have what are known as nectar guides. So nectar guides are uh, patterns that are seen in some flowers that guide the pollinator to the nectar and the pollen, which is the resource that they're um, getting rewarded with. So uh, here you can see that what we see in the visible light as a yellow flower, bees are seeing not exactly like this, because this picture was taken with, um, with a filter for ultraviolet light, but something like this, with these veins that point toward the middle and a very um, 
well-formed center um, that has the uh, that is um, attracting them using their um, ability to see ultraviolet light. So um, whereas we see the flower like this, the bees can see that center kind of um, bullseye uh, middle of the flower like this, the same here and even here. So they've basically evolved very, very important um, structures and anatomy, morphology that allows them to uh, provide a good pollination service. Now, uh, on the flower's end, this is the morphology of a typical flower. We have different kinds of flowers, and sometimes they self-pollinate, so sometimes the flower have both the male and the female components inside one flower. Sometimes we have trees that have both um, kinds of flowers, different uh, female flowers and, and, and male flowers, and sometimes we even have uh, species of plants that have um, uh, the female and male flowers being produced on different, completely separately, different plants. So the female uh, flower has all of these components, most importantly the stigma, the style, the ovary, which is this um, uh, green area, that uh, big area where the ovules or the eggs lie. And then we have the male component, and as I said, that can be on the same flower or on a different flower. But uh, the most important part is the stamen, which comprises, is comprised of these filaments at the end of which are the anthers, and the anthers are the um, structures that contain the pollen. So then, uh, after I briefly explained this, what is pollination? Pollination then, um, the definition of pollination is the transfer of pollen from the anther of, the, uh, of one flower to the stigma of another flower. And I, I will mention this in more detail uh, with a, a little um, cartoon that I made. But basically, when the bee is here at a flower, they're hoping that uh, that process of pollination is happening. So here's the bee. I hope you see my animation, which is kind of the best um, that I can do. Uh, but you see that flower that's visiting a, a, a bee, a, 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 sorry, a bee that is visiting a flower, collecting uh, food from it, and then inadvertently some of those pollen grains attach to her, and then when she travels to another flower, um, some of those pollen grains from the different flower um, get trapped on the stamen, and then, I don't know if you saw that um, animation, but finally, um, that pollen creates a pollen tube, and when germination is successful, um, that pollen grain reaches the ovule and fertilizes the flower. So this is the process of cross-pollination, and as I said, the bee is really just um, inadvertently collecting food, but, um, but the end result in many cases is pollination and leading to fertilization of that flower to produce seed. What we, when we look at a, a, a bee um, on a flower, we just see her like this. Here is the corbicula where she is collecting all of those pollen grains, uh, turning, turning them into this uh, ball. And she's standing on the anther of a flower. So you can see this anther is long and it's full of pollen grains. Here's a micrograph of an anther. Inside that anther lie all of these millions of pollen grains. Those are the ones, each one of those um, will go and um, fertilize one of those ovules in the plant. Here's another micrograph of successful germination where the pollen grain successfully reached the stamen and it creates these, these um, pollen tubes and then that pollen grain can go down um, the style and uh, fertilize the ovule. But in reality, what we see at, in our scale are these pollen balls that bees bring back to the hive. Okay, so first I want to define a few things. Pathogens are infective agents that grow within the bees. Parasites are infective agents that feed upon the bees, so they're outside, whereas pathogens are inside. And then we have pests like animals that attack honeybee colonies for food or, or other resources. So I just want to, yeah, define these terminologies so you kind of understand 
what I mean. And then we have other factors that are not due to parasites, pests, or pathogens, but are still problematic for beekeepers. And I want to remember, remind you, and this is something that, you know, this um, you can go over this in a lot more detail, but I just want to uh, point out that within inside a honeybee colony, there is horizontal and vertical transmission of infective agents. And that is because here we have a honeybee uh, queen that is laying an egg, and then workers um, provision that larva with food uh, over the course of its larval life until the workers seal that cell and the larva uh, had, uh, pupates and then the worker emerges. So inside all of this, the, the colony life, we have um, vertical transmission that can be done from um, either from the queen to the egg or sometimes the worker to the larva, but there's also horizontal transmission um, between, amongst workers inside the hive. So there's just uh, a lot of room for transmission of all of these um, pathogens and pests. So we have brood pathogens. So brood being uh, the larvae and, and pupae, so uh, individuals that haven't emerged as adults yet. And um, I don't have time to go over these in detail. I just want to give you some of the main uh, terminology. We have uh, some that are caused by bacteria, like the European and American fowl brood. These pictures are basically classic pictures um, of the symptoms of these disorders, or each one of them. And this is what beekeepers and inspectors use to, um, to diagnose um, um, these um, pathogens in the hive. Sometimes it's harder, uh, and so you have to send the um, bee samples to labs so that they can um, do the diagnosis. But uh, there are classic symptoms in each one of these, like the coloration of larva, um, in, for example, in ESB. We have um, sac brood, which is uh, caused by a virus, and as the name indicates, the larva ends up being in, like inside a sac. And then we have another one, like chalk brood, that's called by a fungus, and um, it causes the larvae. It basically, it eats the um, larvae from the inside out, and what you have at the end is this chalk, uh, chalky um, body, and, and they call they're called uh, mummies. So those are the main brood pathogens that one has to deal with. Of course, I forgot to mention, and, and we don't have time to go over this, but for each one of these, there is a proposed treatment, and uh, there's all kinds of treatments, uh, chemical and treatments, and more organic, holistic treatments, but they are not only costly to the beekeeper, but they're also uh, detrimental uh, to the bees, um, if not done properly. And they also cause a lot of um, increased resistance to a lot of these chemicals that are being used. And that's importantly the case in these adult parasites, for example, uh, the varroa mite, which is the biggest problem to beekeepers. They not only feed on, on adults, but they also feed, and they're actually found in more numbers and higher numbers in site cells uh, in developing, developing um, brood. And uh, so they are really costly to treat, and these varroa mites have uh, um, grown to be resistant to the main treatments uh, available or at least uh, legal to use. And so, um, and so we have a, a really, really bad problem with varroa mites. But we also have these tiny uh, tracheal mites that don't allow. These are inside the the trachea of the bees. They, they. Um, that's how bees. Um, oxygenate their tissues is via um, uh, transport of uh, oxygen via these trachea. And if you have these tiny, tiny microscopic uh, mites in big numbers inside your trachea, the bee can't really um, transfer oxygen to to the other bees and uh, to its tissues. And so it can die of kind of basically lack of oxygen. Then we have these either, even tinier um, uh, agents like Nosema, the microsporidian that lives in the gut of honeybees and it causes, this is a normal gut, this is a, a Nosema infected gut, and, and it causes um, um, uh, the digestive system to not work as well and for, for bees to, um, 
uh, have um, they're not able to digest their food properly. This is a clear symptom of nosema because it causes um, dysentery and, and the bees just basically die of malnutrition. And then we have pests. These are the main pests to honeybees. Wax moths, um, so here's a wax moth and here's a wax moth larva that basically um, needs to uh, needs to eat for in order for it to to live its larval life it needs to feed on wax that's hence the name it needs to feed on the wax of of the inside the hive and um it only needs a strong colony strong colonies can usually take care of them but normally sometimes they um they are uh, they get out of hand if the colony is not very strong the same with small hive beetle and this is a stronger problem in the south uh, where it's warmer than than uh, in the north, and and here's a hive beetle, adult, but we have these um, larvae that feed on the food that bees have stored, and so they kind of render that food uh, unedible to humans, um, and and to the bees as well. And then we have other problems like mammals and other insects. Like for example, we have robbers. Like here we have that yellow jacket or other colonies of bees that rob the resources inside a hive. And then we have larger robbers like um, bears and, and raccoons that cause um, destruction of, the, of your apiary and then you have to put up fences and whatnot to try to keep them away. And then we have other economically important factors, um, like chilled brood. That happens when you don't have enough workers to keep the brood uh, warm in the winter. We have shot brood, which happens when the queen is inbred, and so she creates these um, these special line of, of drones that uh, the workers get rid of in the hive, and so you start seeing a lack of brood develop because the workers get rid of them. Then we have laying workers. Sometimes the colonies go queenless, and so as you can see inside this little box inside the cell, there should be only one uh, egg laid by the queen, but because this colony is probably queenless, you have a lot of uh, workers that try to activate their ovaries and start laying unfertilized eggs, and so that turns into a problem. Then you have drone-laying queens, so uh, whereas this is like the flat surface of worker brood here, here you have these that are kind of dome-shaped uh, cells that are larger. Those are for drones or males. And uh, those are not the ones that go out and forage for food. So you don't want to see a lot of drones unless it's during the reproductive season. So if you have a drone-laying queen, that means that she's um, not very well mated, and that's why she starts lay kind of shooting blanks. Then we have problems with poisoning, um, poisoning of crops, and I'll go over this uh, in, in detail later. But um, inadvertent poisoning of crops that bees visit uh, causes sometimes um, the the death of the entire worker population in a colony. And then supersedure, for example, the replacement of of uh, the old queen with a new queen because her quality wasn't good enough. And this is something that I study um, here at NCSU, supersedure. So basically, we have a lot of disorders. The main one that you have probably come across is colony collapse disorder, which is a phenomenon that causes abrupt disappearance of honeybee workers from a colony. Um, this is a picture of a typical uh, CCD um, stricken colony with uh, some brood but no worker population. These are the symptoms um, as of now that that um, uh, are kind of clear um, or symptoms that, that a colony that is um, diagnosed with CCD has to have all of these symptoms in its list. So the suddenly the sudden colony death, presence of the queen bee, lack of healthy adult bees inside the hive, presence of capped fruit in abandoned colonies, presence of food stores that are not immediately robbed, which otherwise would be normally, and the presence of multiple pathogens, pests, and disorders. Um, so we don't have time to go over this. This would be uh, the topic of an entire bioform if we want to talk about CCD, but I wanted to just mention that that's another important disorder. Um, as of last year, or 2009, these are the states in yellow in the United States that have reported colonies that have shown all of those symptoms and thus have been um, 
said to have died of CCD. So, as you can see, it's basically widespread across the country with only a few states not having reported CCD colonies. So, it's pretty much everywhere that you see colonies that will die with these symptoms, although some of these states' um, reports are, are a little uh, controversial right now. But remember the picture I showed you earlier of the number of colonies over time and the decline of them uh, over time in the United States. Um, when, with, with the advent of this, with the report of CCD uh, in the United States, which was more, more um, in oh, around 2006, uh, we saw a. This is here. We have the overall colony losses in 2006, 2008. So there was a very high uh, colony loss uh, over winter colony loss. Usually, um, there are winter losses of about 10 percent. Those are normal, but 40 percent is really not normal. And um, and um, the percent of those losses that was due to CCD in 2006, 2007 was 60 percent. So basically, almost all the the majority of colonies that were lost during that year uh, were due to CCD. And um, this number seems to have dropped uh, ever since, um, mainly because we have kind of changed our definition of CCD. And so our uh, group is more restrictive. But it's still a really high number of losses due to CCD. So that's pretty much um, what where we are right now as far as CCD losses. And um, the last thing I want to say is that the current research suggests that CCD is caused by a synergistic detrimental effect of viruses and other disorders. So here you have all those brute pathogens that I mentioned earlier, the adult brute pest um, disorders. <coughs> and it's been found in the latest studies that um, the majority of CCD colonies um, were infected with three or more viruses compared to control colonies. So uh, most of CCD colonies had all of these things, a uh, combination of these, all of these um, pathogens and disorders, um, including sublethal levels of some chemicals. Um, and so, as you can see, there really isn't agreement of what CCD is and how to treat it, but we know now that there is just a, a synergistic detrimental effect of a bunch of them acting at once on already um, immunocompromised colonies. Okay, so that's that as far as pathogens and pests. Now we have other factors that are influencing honeybee health, and that's uh, the next one is nutrition. Uh, and especially pollen, pollen collection, uh, well, there's also nectar, but po pollen is really important because it is the source of protein in the hive. And there's a critical role of pollen diversity inside uh, honeybee colonies. Um, here we have, for example, a picture of polyculture. That is basically a, a plot of land that has multiple pollen sources in the same area, gardens and, and po uh, uh, polyculture modules. Um, but the the opposite is monocultures, where you have one crop that is being produced for acres and acres on end, uh, with no not a lot of pollen diversity. Um, so dietary protein diversity, which comes from this polyfloral pollen, has a direct impact on the immunocompetence of or the immune system of bees, and it's been found that polyfloral diets. Uh, enhance the immune functions of bees. They provide better antiseptic protection, and they have they produce higher amounts of the different uh, wide array of amino acids that are required for tissue development and growth. So, um, so the lack of of pollen diversity kind of causes the opposite effects, right? So, um, not a lot of diversity for tissue development and, and whatnot. Then as far as, for example, pollen and nectar, and these are controversial studies. Don't quote me on these. These are things that are in the works for by other labs, and, and they're still controversial in the scientific community, but they're being, um, but they're being explored. Uh, for example, genetically modified crops like Bt corn. Here you have a picture of normal corn and then um, Bt corn. Uh, are being used in agriculture as alternatives to direct pesticide application. And um, for example, in Bt corn, uh, 
it expresses the Cry1AB protein in the tissues, in the corn tissues, that cause lesions in the mid-gut of the target species that they're trying to, to kill. So they're not trying to kill honeybees. They're just trying to kill the insect pests. But sometimes honeybees visit corns when, they're, when they have pollen available. And so when they do, uh, there, some people think that Bt corn and that protein Cry1AB uh, when fed in, in high concentrations, uh, can show delayed food consumption and learning in some studies in honeybees. So, for example, this is a laboratory study where they did the mean time to consume the, the, a contaminated syrup, and there was a significant increase in the delay of food consumption between control and um, food that was contaminated with, uh, with uh, a lot of of that Cry1AB um, protein. So that's still controversial, but that's actually some of the things that are happening right now uh, as far as studies. There's also an effect of uh, pesticides on honeybee health. So for example, the, um, the use of systemic pesticides. Systemic pesticides are chemicals that are absorbed by plants and they render their parts poisonous. So um, they are taken up by the root system and then they are expressed in their leaves and also their flowers and, and, and nectar and pollen. Those, some of those systemic pesticides have a very high specific affinity to a special receptor in the insects, in the target insects, especially in the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And they are extremely toxic to honeybees. However, we use them more and more because they are relatively not toxic to mammals, including humans. So that's why people use systemic pesticides. And there are, the advantage is that they're always present, whereas the ones that you spray and are uh, topically um, um, applied as soon as there is uh, rain, for example, it washes off, whereas the systemic pesticide still remains. The most infamous of these is the neonicotinoid imidacloprid, which is used to spray a lot of different, uh, sorry, that is used in a lot of different crops. And um, this is um, the molecule. And um, it's been banned in, for example, in France. This is a picture of a lot of riots that have happened in France because uh, it was being applied to uh, sunflowers. Um, uh, as a pesticide, but then when bees went to visit sunflowers, they were returning home and getting sick. So then they did these studies, and I don't have time to explain this very much, but basically here we have the, um, here in, in, the, in the circles we have the control colonies, and here we have those that were fed with syrup with imidacloprid. And so the results basically trust me that um, that when fed imidacloprid, some experiments show decreased learning and memory in honeybees. So these are still controversial and in the works, but there seems to be an effect of these neonicotinoids on honeybee learning when they go visit flowers that are contaminated with them. And finally, we have an effect of climate and the environment on honeybee health. Um, Climate may change the phenology of the honeybee pollinated plants that cause early plant flowering and nectar flow. Um, for example, there's this project done by a NASA um, oceanographer that's a hobbyist honeybee keeper, and he noticed using, by weighing his colonies that, and, and using other resources from from NASA that basically he noticed that uh, there was early bloom uh, or plant flowering and nectar flow, and so that may change the availability of flow um, of nectar flow of uh, to honeybees throughout the year, and that's where I'm going to leave it. But if you're interested in knowing more, you can go to Honeybee Net Project, where you can learn more information about this. Climate may also change the geographic distribution of flower species that bees depend on for food. So there may some, whereas in the past some plant species would be available to pollinate and to get nectar from, no longer is the case in some areas. And then climate can also 
cause excess drought or rain, which reduces the nectar and pollen quantity and quality available, which may in turn weaken the bee's immune system or cause death by starvation. So some examples, uh, for example, here, uh, when there's excess rain, these acacia flowers uh, in France um, get the, the rain washes off all of the nectar provided by the bee, the colon, the flower. So uh, basically, the bees don't have a food reward. And the extreme is that in extreme drought, uh, these lavender flowers shut down their production of pollen. So the bee doesn't have access to pollen. So those are some direct implications of climate change. And then we have the effects of the environment um, uh, in honeybee health. So. This is kind of a convoluted graph um, from this study by Perini et al. But basically, in the gray, we have areas that show sectors that are visited by honeybees and the pollution or the diffusion of pollutants in the environment. And so that polluting um, or that pollutant can pollute the air, the soil, the water. And then honeybees are going back and forth, visiting plants, and, and going back and forth to the hive and bringing in all of these pollutants. And so um, these people, by catching foragers upon the return to the hive, uh, found high levels of ha heavy metals inside hives, like lead, chromium, and nickel, particularly. And so this seems to suggest that persistent air contamination can induce higher absorption of those pollutants, either via inhalation or ingestion, into the bees' bodies during foraging. And so, and, and they can cause detrimental effects in the hive. So, even though we went fast, uh, and this is just a very tiny percentage of all the studies available that show that all of these different uh, factors, uh, diseases, nutrition, pesticides, and uh, uh, climate in the environment um, affect honeybee health in many different ways. Um, so uh, in the last five minutes or so, I hope that I can show you, and we all agree that uh, having healthy honeybees uh, equates to having healthy ecosystems and vice versa. So now we don't only think of, um, we have to think of, uh, kind of place ourselves right here in the middle of this interaction between the plants and the crops they pollinate. So the bees are providing a service so that at the end, all of this delicious food that we like to eat is, is provided by, uh, to us and to the bees. But also we have to be careful in providing the perfect um, ecosystem for those bees to provide those ecosystem services. So it's kind of like a two-way street. Uh, uh, and, and we, as humans, have to be here in the middle trying to uh, ameliorate the, the situation for both ends of the bargain. So that we have what uh, what we like to see in the stores, which are uh, beautiful fruits and vegetables and even flowers that we like to consume. Uh, and so we we get complete pollination, which produces fruits are, and vegetables are symmetric and larger. So uh, we like to see very plum and sweet and delicious food. Um, and we, um, on the other hand, we don't want to see either no pollination or incomplete pollination, which is uh, um, the production of fruits and vegetables are asymmetric and smaller uh, because basically if, uh, if one of those uh, plant species has many of those ovules that need to be fertilized, if only a few of them do, then um, the, the fruits look wobbly and they're not as delicious and, and as sweet and, and, and such. And we, um, toward the, um, in the extreme case, we don't want to go through the hassles that other countries have already had to go through. For example, this is just this was just released over a year ago. Um, Japanese fruit farmers stung badly by bee shortage, and what happened was that in 2008, uh, Japan used to import most of their honeybee colonies from um, Australia, and then. Um, they had to quarantine all the uh, importation or stop or halt all the importation of honeybee colonies, which, as I said, was 80% of them. And so uh, suddenly, very suddenly, there was no bees. There were no bee uh, populations to pollinate all of their crops in Japan. So they had to 
uh, resort to uh, hand pollination. So this is a tragic story of what happens on, right now in Japan, where uh, people um, have to hand pollinate apples and pears in order for people to be able to obtain them in the stores at a much higher price. And uh, um, and so it's it, that's the tragic story that we don't want to um, end up having to to go to. Uh, luckily, there's a lot of research, beekeeping, and agricultural practices that are aimed at mitigating and preventing harmful factors that are affecting honeybees right now. We are beginning to understand that we need polycultures and we need uh, diverse pollen sources. And so now, not only for honeybees, but also for wild pollinators, um, more and more research is showing that it's really good to have nectar corridors with a lot of different varied seed mixes. So here you have all the different mixes depending on where you are and what uh, pollinator you're trying to attract. Um, we are uh, conducting a lot of research. Uh, this is Marla Spivak, uh, um, the researcher in Minnesota that came up with the line of Minnesota hygienic honeybees, so special genetic lines of bees that kind of take care of their own pests or pathogens without having to use heavy chemicals uh, to con uh, combat them. We are uh, growing in our practices of organic farming that uh, decreases the use of pesticides that can be used inadvertently, um, uh, or yeah, can be picked up inadvertently by bees, killing them. We are increasing our um, budget for honeybee research and honeybee health research, and, and this is only expected to increase um, over the years. And then um, just um, civilian, um, interest and, and um, people that are just um, know how difficult it is, uh, bees are having um, it right now. So for example, the Sierra Club uh, in 2008 uh, issued a letter to the EPA here in the United States to ban imidacloprid uh, from as a systemic pesticide just like they did in France because they know that it harms honeybees. So um, you can just... Uh, um, participate in a lot of these uh, endeavors to increase uh, awareness and, and help increase the health of honeybees. So to conclude, honeybees provide many pollination services and agroecosystems. They are responsible for pollinating over a third of the food we consume. The pollination of managed honeybee colonies has continually dropped while our demand for bee pollinated crops continues to increase. Many factors, many, many factors, and I only gave you an example of few, um, influence honeybee health. And novel research, beekeeping, and farming practices will help improve the quality and quantity of our honeybee populations, especially in an expanded global market that is ever demanding for um, these delicious honeybee pollinated crops. I'm gonna leave you with this quote uh, by Keith Delaplane. So it says, more people, around planet Earth want ice cream, blueberry tarts, watermelon, almond chocolate bars, coffee, and yes, McDonald's hamburgers. And the trend shows no sign of slowing. So to what extent does the quality of human life depend on honeybee pollination? And that's something for you to ponder on. But he answers it saying that, I would say a lot if you're fortunate enough to live in an economy where bee pollinated crops make up a significant fraction of what, what considers a normal diet, which can be different for, for every person. But I will leave you with this. Um, this was published in Scientific America, but this is um, uh, a picture of a typical breakfast um, at a, you know, on a, a North American table. Uh, that includes food that would require honeybee pollination for its production. So here we have the granola with the delicious almonds and berries. We have uh, uh, fruit juice, coffee in in our in our uh, milk in our coffee, jam and fruit and and eggs. And here we have um, that same scenario without honeybee pollination. So I suspect, as I said, we wouldn't kind of go extinct because there are a lot we a lot of wind pollinated crops like rice and wheat that we could consume for survival, but I hope we all agree that our diet would be um, less diverse and less interesting. So with that, um, 
thank you for your attention. I know this was a lot of information, but uh, I would be happy to take any questions or give you more uh, references if you're interested uh, um, right after this. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Rangel. We do have uh, several questions that have come in over the course of the presentation today, and I put those on the screen, and we can talk about those now. Okay. Give me one second. Let me go through these first. Sure. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to uh, type those in the chat box. We can uh, still squeeze in a few. I know that we're running a few minutes over, but uh, it's. Uh, I feel like the question portion of the conversation is very important, so we want to uh, make sure that we make the time to talk about your questions. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Dan, is everyone looking at these? Questions too? Yes, they okay. should be on the, everyone's screen right now. Okay. Um, let me go one by one and I'll tell you if I have the answer or not. Propolis, what specific pharmaceutical benefits can this be? Well, propolis is consumed, They. it is believed and research has shown that propolis has a lot of antimicrobial kind of an antibiotic properties, and so people use them. They distill them. Uh, they, actually, propolis, it's very sticky when you collect it, but somehow they distill those those main components and, and put them into a lot of uh, beauty products, um, things that are good for your skin that give vigor and, and um, to your skin, so a lot of lotions um, and sprays. And even uh, they are put in multivitamin vitamin, um, pills, like those that that all all day kind of um, all in one um, multivitamins and multimineral. Um, so I don't know the specific chemicals are in it, but they are used for those purposes. Is there a measurement for pumpkin as far as the, I, I, I take it that you're asking whether the measurement is for pumpkin production and there is such a such a value. So if you want to email me with that specific question as to if you're referring to the United States and or um, North Carolina, I can send you that. But that's from the NASS, the NAS, the National Association or National Statistics Service. Um, of the USDA. So uh, you can access NAS and it will give you basically anything and everything you want. It's overwhelming the amount of statistics that are uh, out there for every crop that is produced in the United States. And it's not only um, available for the United States, but also for each state and also for each county. Um, and so they're updated every year, and you can get probably at this point, you can probably start getting all the 2010 values. All you have to do is dig in, which takes time, but uh, you can email me, and I can send you more of that. Bees can't see red, so why don't beekeepers wear red protective suits? And that's a good question. Um, actually, in fact, there are... Um, there are some people that wear red suits, uh, but I think we don't wear red protective suits because depending on the red, um, there might be some other uh, hues in that suit that can be attractive. And see, bees also, um, I forgot to mention, but they also see a lot uh, of shapes and contours. And so if you're in a background that's green and you see this, thing, this moving object, that would be your you as a beekeeper moving with your red suit, they would see that contrast between you and the background. Even though they probably can't see that red, they will see that something is moving that is kind of not the same color. And so uh, they would probably go for it. And, and whereas white seems to be a little less dramatic of a change in, in uh, contrast between the background and the beekeeper. Um, is there a difference in the flower or vegetables as opposed to flowers that are decorative? Um, yes and no. I mean, um, honeybees, as long as that flower is providing a food resource, that is, if they're providing both nectar and pollen, the bee will likely go and visit it. 
Uh, it, it also depends on the morphology of the flower. Some flowers have their stamen or the style um, is too large and the bee's mouth parts are not able to reach the food source. So it's not that um, that foods that uh, that flowers that produce lead to the production of vegetables are more desirable. It basically is on a um, case by case basis, depending on the morphology of that flower and whether it is providing a food reward. Can hives be moved from North Carolina to other parts of the country? Yes. Uh, in fact, some people in North Carolina uh, do uh, have pollination um, operations. Uh, but in a low scale, because um, the thing is that North Carolina is comprised mainly of hobbyists or small scale, scale beekeepers. Uh, people like in Florida and Pennsylvania that have hundreds of thousands of colonies per operation are the ones that provide most of the pollination services to crops like the almonds in California. Um, but um, having said that, basically, People that choose to use their colonies for pollination, including North Carolina, have a wide open market and a high demand for their colonies. It's just that when you use, even though you're getting a good reward, monetary reward for pollination, uh, it's also very costly to the bees, as I showed you, for many reasons. And so some beekeepers choose not to use their hives for pollination, and they prefer to produce uh, honey. Um, but yeah, you can move your colonies from North Carolina where to pretty much anywhere in the country, and some people do. What is the adaptability of a hive in different climates with different food sources? Bees are very um, plastic or very flexible in the food that they will consume. They are generalists, and so they um, we are lucky that they they eat food from all of these flowers that, as I said earlier, have uh, nectar resources, uh, rewards. So that's why people can move them um, from place to place. And they will, after a couple of days of kind of getting used to the their local landmarks and their environment, they will start searching for food. However, having said that, as I said earlier, there is just a lot of stress on these colonies because they, if there's, there are changes in altitude, as you said, climate and food sources, they have to kind of go back and start from scratch and, uh, and, and know what's out there and, and how to get it. So they are very plastic. They can go to different food sources in different climates, but they have to learn it as they go. And sometimes, as I said earlier, um, places with <coughs> dramatic uh, climate changes like drought or excess rain can lead to a decline in food availability and thus uh, pollination. What are the brambles included in fruits and vegetables? Uh, I don't know what you mean by that. Let me see. Dan, what's a bramble? <laughs> uh, let's see. Brambles equals blackberries, raspberries, according to Todd oh, Walker. Berries, okay. Um, what? Why are they? Well, uh, it was just something that we consume and we consider fruits. So that just that's how he um, categorized it. It's not because we're saying that they become they are fruits and vegetables. They just he just put them in there. But for example, blueberries um, they require honeybees uh, for the production of new varieties. So that's why we put them there. I'm, I'm reading over these and then I'll give you answers. Hold on. The next question, um, I don't know um, anything about tobacco and whether it gets pollinated even in part by honeybees. So I don't know, but I can get back to you to see if what effect has changed in, in tobacco production on honeybee pollination. And then I have to say that I am sorry, but I haven't read the book, The Secret Life of Bees. So um, I have heard that they um, got some uh, um, 
advice from um, scientists, honeybee scientists, but I, I can't confirm that. So I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. I barely have any time to read scientific journals. Um, Uh, the question, I'm surprised to see the X in the lane workers photo located on the bottom of the cell rather than the side. Is that common? Yes. You pretty much, in a colony that has gone queenless and that has um, ultimately ended with the some workers activating their ovaries and laying unfertilized eggs, which lead to drones, um, basically things have gone array. Even though the colony wants to raise a new queen, it probably has, doesn't have the resources to raise a new queen, and it's too late. So at that point, it's, there are some physiological changes in these workers, but also kind of complete colony chaos. And so the workers start laying eggs um, in high numbers, and they just put them everywhere. So although those pictures only showed them at the bottom, as you pointed out correctly, they will be on the sides and everywhere. So there's basically everywhere, um, not only the bottom, always on the side, but uh, mostly at the bottom though, because the worker just it kind of drops to the bottom. But um, I thought Dr. Tarpey and Don Hopkins said that we have no confirmed cases of CCD in North Carolina to date. Has there been? And the answer, or my official answer, is no, um, because as I said. Those colonies have to um, have died with all of those symptoms um, included. And even though the graph that I showed was uh, included in, C, um, in yellow, um, those cases are under investigation. And um, the official account is that there haven't been cases of complete collapse. The problem is that it depends on what you consider collapse. Uh, and that list of symptoms is ever-changing and ever-growing. And so um, they, some might have uh, had most of those um, bulleted points or symptoms, but not all of them. So as of right now, there's, it's basically, it depends on who you ask. And Don and, and David will say no. Other people will disagree with them because it depends on how, where you draw the line as to what CCD is. And let me see the last one. I don't I I feel like I am um, I don't have the expertise to tell you whether sawdust or uh cut wood, freshly cut wood has any nutrition um to honeybees, but my my suspicion is no, unless I mean, let's say my my answer is no. Um, I don't know of any um, anything nutritional about uh, about this plant material because honeybees collect or they're basically feed on only nectar and, and pollen. So if there's any plant material with cell walls and just plant cells, I don't think that the bees will consume them for anything. However, they might use um, uh, some of these uh, resins and, and materials from the hive, not for consumption, but for the production of propolis to seal their, their hives and to kind of uh, create the sealed environment inside the hive. So as I said, um, if you have any more questions, anything else pops up, um, sorry we took a little longer, but those were interesting questions, and so I can try to answer them uh, online via email. So don't hesitate to email me if you have any more questions. And thank you for your time. Thank you again, Dr. Rangel, and thank you for submitting your questions. I will uh, have dropped uh, your email address there in the chat box, so if you have any additional questions, you can contact Dr. Rangel that way. And as we wrap up today, take a moment just uh, to help us out and answer a brief survey. It's on the right side of your screen. Your feedback will help us as we plan future Bioform events. And then be sure to click Submit when you're finished. While you're doing that, note that today's presentation was recorded so you can view it again. You will receive a thank you email from BioNetwork that will include a web link to the recording. And you can find out about other Bioform events by visiting our website, ncbionetwork.org. And please mark your calendar for our March Bioform. 
Registration for this event is free and available online at ncbionetwork.org. I would like to again thank Dr. Juliana Rangel for being our panelist today. Thanks also to North Carolina Bio Network for making this presentation possible. And thanks to you for your time and participation. This concludes our webinar. And on behalf of Bio Network, thank you and have a great day.